Dr. James Richardson, thanks so much for joining me this week on Succession Stories. You had reached out to me to come on the show, which I always love. It's always great to hear from a fan and people who think they can uh, collaborate in an interesting way for the benefit of the audience. And I'm really excited about today's episode because you have so much experience in working with startups and how those startups ultimately and strategically look to get either acquired or partner with larger, more well-established companies. And because our core audience here for Succession Stories are probably uh, more in the latter category, more well-established, I thought it'd be really interesting as a way to continue this innovation conversation that I've been having with multiple guests about how can large companies get back to their entrepreneurial roots? And I'm really excited to talk to you because I think you're going to bring a really cool perspective. So welcome. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, I'm, I was, uh, your show attracted me because I think it's going to help me reach a different audience than I normally talk to. <laughs> so yeah, thank you again. you're normally talking to uh, CPG. So we're going to use yeah. that acronym, which yep. is stands for what? Consumer packaged goods or everything sold at Target. <laughs> Everything's sold at Target, and you work with a lot of <laughs> startup CPG companies. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your background and how you got involved in working with CPG companies, startups in particular? Okay, I'll give you the two-minute version. Here we go. You can time me. Uh, <laughs> I began as a as an academic anthropologist, so I, I left academia about 20, 22 years ago. Uh, for a variety of reasons. I went into market research and my first client uh, at our company was Whole Foods Market. In fact, we had a retainer with the management team because um, it was small and uh, they were pretty hands-on, at least Walter Robb was <laughs> at the time. So I got thrown into the deep end of emerging food and beverage trends in the United States related to health, wellness, organic, all the weird and wacky stuff the left coast stuff, uh, as it was still perceived back then. So I, I sort of immersed myself through consumer research for my clients, uh, and traveled the country and got really into emerging trends, behavioral trends, you know, why do people adopt an organic food diet, for example? So that's, um, that was my entry to the business world. It was a mix of social science research, uh, with a, you know, marketing strategy sort of component to it. Later on in my career, I started working with bigger uh, public firms um, that were interested in renovating the brands that they had because they were slowing down. This would be like the late 2000s. And uh, companies are trying to do innovation way off of the normal core innovation that their internal teams were used to doing, i.e., pseudo entrepreneurial innovation. <laughs> um, and, you know, when that basically came to a head with a project I did about six, seven years ago for Coca-Cola venturing and emerging brands where they were, they'd set up an incubator that made in minority investments and tried to boost small brands that they acquired. And, you know, their success rate was hit or miss. Um, actually the most successful Coca-Cola VEB brand they've ever had has been Fairlife Milk, which was a joint venture with an entrepreneur. <laughs> Funny thing. <laughs> when they tried to do it, when they tried to buy little startups, didn't work. Um, when they tried to partner or tried to do it themselves, didn't work. Uh, so I did, you know, and I worked a lot at the end of my big company consulting career with corporate strategy and other folks trying to figure out, could they create units inside? that would do this stuff. And, you know, we can talk about that in a little bit, but that yeah. I went out on my own to work with startups because I had done some data science research and the company was gracious enough to let me use that for my new company. Cause they didn't do anything with it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, that's always a challenge. I think it's a challenge for larger well-established companies to have an innovation process. I mean, somebody like a Coca-Cola has been at this for a while, right? Whether they're creating their own internal brands or, whether they're looking to partner, as you mentioned, a couple of examples. And so for privately held companies who, you know, maybe they've been feeling disruption for a while and, and disruption that and many people think is because it's because of technology. And I believe that it's actually because of the customer, the customer's tastes are changing and maybe there's some 
uh, market dynamics that have exacerbated those tastes or practices to change. And so companies that are looking at themselves, taking a really hard look, I think 2020 has forced a lot of changes in companies, whether it's uh, how, you know, their personnel practices and work from home and those types of things that we all think about and we're impacted by, but also how they go to market. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about the customer in this, in this sense. Okay. One of the things I really liked about your book, which I, you know, which I read, um, thank you, <laughs> and called "Ramping Ramping Your Brand." Uh, one of the things I really liked about it, there's, a, uh, I want to focus on demand-driven growth, mm -hmm. which is this notion of consumer pull, right? Mm -hmm. Consumers pulling a company towards a certain direction, mm -hmm. and let's talk about that for a moment. What does that mean to you? What it means to me is that the product design itself in the core, you know, UPCs, as they say in my world, uh, it unconsciously has uh, unlocked something that was sort of buried underneath the conscious thought stream of the ordinary consumer, um, but was actually really powerful. It was either an unsolved problem, you could call it an unmet need, you could call it a latent desire. Uh, in my book, I talk about um, outcomes as sort of what you're really designing for. And when you get the most successful early stage CPG brands that I tend to work with or advise, what they've got is this original innovation, which is very conceptually simple, Lori. And that's one reason why it is able to become memorable very quickly with a otherwise pretty busy human brain in modern urban life. Um, and it taps into, it, it taps into either a problem or it basically redefines uh, the problem and how to solve it. And it does this uh, very quickly. It does it unconsciously through symbolism and through the usage of it. And sometimes it's the sensory experience or the usage of the product, which finally gets people over the hump where they're like, oh, wow. So here's an example. One of the fastest growing brands no one's ever really talked about in the business world in the last 10 years was a, was a tiny little <laughs> innovation from a private label PETA manufacturer up in Wisconsin, Milwaukee to be exact. And so he has this big private label business. He has plants and he invented a chicken pita pocket sandwich that microwaves in 55 seconds from frozen. It's the fastest microwave. It was the fastest microwave, you know, thermal runway product on the market when it came out. I think 55 seconds and I think I'm going to get rubber chicken. No, nope, it's, yum, rubber it's chicken. yummy. Yep. It's yummy. So, so the innovation he, was the speed. The innovation was simply the, simply the mechanics of his plant. He was willing to retool his plant and take a risk on that retooling to make this pita pocket sandwich and stick a half of a chicken breast inside that had been pre-cooked and pre-fried. Uh, and it was that willingness to retool his plant to do something that nobody else in the entire North American infrastructure could do, including the big guys, right? Um, to chase something that was really simple, which was that, and if you talk to mothers and hang out with them, uh, <laughs> listeners, especially the male listener, <laughs> um, you will learn that the difference between two and a half minutes and 60 seconds with a screaming seven-year-old in your face is massively consequential. Yeah, you know, very and, high utility to make that child stop screaming. <laughs> so the cultural insight there is that time is, time is, um, has, is always relative to the context in which you're perceiving time. This is not a physics class. This is cultural anthropology 101 and it's neuroscience. So when people get really stressed, time slows down. And that's why you'll hear mothers talk about, oh my God, I can't believe it. I made it to the end of the day today because mm -hmm. they probably had constant fights with their kids. And you know, to them, it was like a 30 hour day, even though it was supposed to be 12 hours. So what kind of market so, research did this entrepreneur do to have this discovery and find this so find he didn't need I don't think he do it I don't think he did any other than talk to his daughter and did she she had kids yeah I mean this is not a complicated discovery process and I think this is the challenge I have with big companies doing innovation is they they tend to overcomplicate the entire process um, and in the in the meantime they generally aren't listening 
they aren't really listening. Um, you know, at the company I used to work at, we used to do very expensive innovation discovery projects, and the client was always trying to take us to the to the what I call the tar pit of weird. Just weird, weird symbols, weird ingredients, stuff they'd seen on the web, stuff in some weird restaurant in LA. This is not how you do fast growing innovation, folks. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing I agree with the late Clayton Christensen about. This is not how you do innovation. Avoid the top pit so, of the weird. Yeah, because the problem, with the, the problem with, there's a lot of, in the United States, you have 30, 330 million people. You can find a million people who will chase absolutely bizarre, almost deviant things. I mean, it's just, we're that big, right? So the fact that you can find an audience that comes back to you doesn't actually create the pull that leads to scale. And that's what my book is about. Because you can create pull in a, in a basically a tiny niche, kale chips, um, anti-inflammatory nutrition. There's a niche that's going nowhere. Because uh, so, there's no way to talk about it without right. sounding like a, like a medicine. And most people want a pill when they want a medical benefit. They don't want a medical outcome from food. And they never will, because it terrifies them, right? So these are all the cultural rules, which if you learn them, I've spent 20 years learning them. But if you learn them uh, for your particular category, you can do that relatively quickly if you just listen and ask people how they use the, how do they use the category, right? So if you can find that really simple innovation, whether it's talking, whether you're the manufacturer, if you just listen to his daughter, because a daughter can get dad to listen to her, even if he doesn't listen to any other female in his life, including the office, right? But the daughter can get <laughs> So he's, listen he's listening. Yeah, let's, let's get tactical for a second, James. Yeah. Like what are, if someone's listening and they're thinking, yeah, I wanna, I wanna listen, I wanna listen better. You know, how can a company go on a listening tour? Is it at focus groups? Is it surveys? Is it a certain number of people that we wanna be talking to? No, it's definitely not a focus. Group. It's not any traditional research technique. It, it's as simple as having a coffee shop style conversation um, with uh, ordinary consumers of, of the category that you manufacture or sell. That can be done for your customer database. You could literally do a random sample. You could just do a random pick from a customer email list. And my, that's what I tell my clients to do. And you just get them on the phone for half an hour. And the key really is as simple as just asking some open-ended questions that all have words like what and how and why. And if you ask open-ended questions, which most business people don't do, if you, if you study how most business people, because they're, they're even, once you get to a hundred million dollars, you know, most companies operate bureaucratically. So most of them are trained to ask command and control questions. And what are command and control questions? Well, they're like the military. Launch the rocket, set up that they're all commands or they're either yes, no questions. And so this gets very ingrained in corporate bureaucracies. Um, it's part of the disciplinary device of any bureaucracy is actually to basically to do nothing but ask yes and no questions and issue orders. Yeah, and the challenge so you, with that could be you really, that the company thinks they know the answer, oh, right? Yeah. They're just testing the answer, whereas an open-ended is more, I want to discover the answer. Yeah, I mean, one of the big, I just wrote about this in a blog post, one of the big problems with CBG companies is, and after like 15 years of doing innovation projects where I was really working closely with teams, I've come to the conclusion the problem was not that they couldn't come up with an idea. It's that A, they couldn't listen. Uh, and B, they were really not given the autonomy to listen. From the man, from the executives. So, to what you were saying, most market research is really just uh, an attempt to validate somebody's guess. Mm -hmm. And when there's so little open inquiry into the consumer in your organization, my best advice is not to, to not use any central processes, but really to, to to go rogue. I mean, it's pretty much the only way to do it. In other words, you need to step out of all the normal processes and do something crazy, like call your customer service division up, get a hundred random phone numbers and start calling <laughs> and have this, have this open-ended conversation. Um, is a hundred the, the right number? Is no, there, I, I, I number of 10, can you get no, 10 good, good I, you, conversations? And eight to 10, eight to 10 good conversations. If you're trying to unsurface problems in the category that you haven't listened to should be enough. Um, but even better would be for you to hang out with folks. Mm -hmm. 
So the way you the way you learn that the sixty seconds thermal runway is is revolutionary to a busy mom with young kids at home versus two and a half minutes is because you you actually just hang out with her, you go have tea with her and coffee, and then you just hang out and then you disappear into the background. Um, and this is all doable, uh, believe it or not. Um, professional researchers do this on a regular basis. They charge a lot of money, but you could do it yourself. People in your company could do it as well. Yeah. I, I think it tends not to be the executives who should be doing this because they're very hard for them to step out of their command and control <laughs> yeah. mindset. So usually it's somebody else. Um, and believe it or not, like customer service people are perfect at this. And you might say, well, wait a minute, they haven't been trained in research. Like they don't need to be trained in research. They just need to give like five or six general questions that get people talking. And the real benefit of a customer service person is they're just, they are hired usually at the good ones and trained to just um, keep people emotionally comfortable in a conversation. Yeah, no, for sure. Right. <laughs> for sure. And I actually had an experience with this about 15 or so years ago. I, I yeah. worked for a, a well-known apparel retailer. And mm. one of the things that we were tasked to do in the marketing group was some cultural anthropology studies. And mm. we traveled to Texas and, of course, with permission from the families and all, and uh, went to visit high schoolers in their in their home and how did they feel about yeah. the brand and how it was a clothing company and you know we had some really interesting discoveries that way and so a b2b company might be thinking oh well that's not for me but you still can have conversations with your customer whether it's over zoom or other a virtual coffee yeah. right and just asking these open-ended questions you really so can learn lots. the key the key lore is that and for listeners is that you need the the conversation needs to be about the category not your business and, and this is one of the big problems that I see in like in big company research with consumers is <laughs> everything in the conversation starts with trying to get feedback on their brand. And I can't think of a better waste of time. If you think about interpersonal analogy, it's sort of like me, like, I don't know, doing it. <laughs> going to talk with your employees, Lori, and say, I want to talk to you about Lori Barkman. <laughs> so what, and now, yeah, I mean, the reality is that they're just going to give you a bunch of nonsense. And unless they're like me, who are brutally honest, um, you know, they're going to give you, they're going to tell you what they think will please you. So you, you know, and that used to be a real challenge, I think, because, uh, teams were given a mission from an executive, I want to innovate for X brand. And we would tell them, this is not how you do this. Uh, you, I don't care that, that you have a $2 billion brand called Velveeta, who cares? You're selling cheese sauce, that's what you're selling. So you may be the biggest brand, but that doesn't really concern us for this investigation. If you wanna find out something else to do, in this space, you have to talk about your category because consumers think in categories first and consumer baggage goods. Very few brands actually make it get ridden on a shopping list, like probably 10% or less. And, and that's humbling, I think, for most people to discover. Most, most brands are interchangeable. And um, even if people come back to them again and again, it's still the category they're buying because the category is what defines the outcome that they're seeking. Right. So if you want to find a new way to service an old outcome, the modern way to do it, or you want to find some unmet need, you've got to have this, you have to have a much broader contextual conversation with people. And the thing, the reason that entrepreneurs do better with innovation on average is that <laughs> they tend to be the people for whom that unmet needs for some reason. And I've never figured out what it is. It comes to their conscious awareness. Like they, they're a mom who literally, maybe they had a marketing degree or something, so they have some self-aware, some self-critical, some glimmer, some spark, right? But they, the ones who woke up and said, I, you know, they just had a blowout with their seven-year-old who didn't want to wait two and a half minutes for their hot pocket, and then they had come to the idea. I mean, it, that's literally how a lot of entrepreneurs in, in food get going. There's no research they had a mind that was not biased. It wasn't biased one by category arrogance, right? So, but they just literally 
reacted honestly to a problem and said, I think I have a solution. The solution is we need something that nukes in one minute. Yeah, it's solving right. the problem. I think <laughs> regardless of what industry you're in, that's uh, really at the core. Is, is now, your product or service solving a problem? I think the other thing, I've worked with corporate R&D and, corp and marketing folks and a, a little bit with sales, but I'm going to leave the sales guys out of it. <laughs> and I'm going to tick off a whole bunch of people here, but corporate sales, important function, but it's really a distribution function. That, that's what it is. I mean, really. So in a big company, those sales relationships were created decades ago. All you're doing is keeping them alive. You're not really creating anything from new. R&D is creating stuff from new. And if marketing is working on a, like a new brand project or something, then that's what they're trying to do. But actually R&D in any big company that makes widgets, they're actually the only ones creating stuff new all the time. Whether it's a new flavor, they figure out how to commercialize. So I'm a big proponent of the 3M culture. And anyone who follows the business news knows the founder posted note just died this weekend of natural causes. 3M continues to have the best internal culture for innovation um, that is the next best thing to just having a bunch of entrepreneurs that you have an alliance with who've pre-sold their innovation to you and no one does, no, and no one does that. So, and the reason that they have that culture is that they actually, for decades, they have, they have organized internal events that are not a joke. They're not a parties with four smiles where the R and D and the marketing, the sales guys, they go golfing, they do kayaking, whatever it is, they hang out together on corporate time, okay? They're paid the same salary. They're not asked to go do it on their own time. There's a joke. They're paid to hang out with each other on a regular, on structured ritual basis. And that, what that does is that creates a mutual empathy, right? Between the reality of commercializing something and the reality of trying to get people to try it, right? That's one. But the real thing that happened at 3M all the time is that, you know, people, because they spend so much in R&D, more than most like food and beverage companies, which are atrociously under budgeted in R&D. Um, they would just, they just play around. They're like, 3M was like Google before Google existed in the world of chemistry. They just, they've got thousands of people and they just play with stuff. And every once in a while they stumble on something like, wow, I wonder, I, I think this might solve a problem. So they approach it the other way, which is just fund a lot of R&D and have enough interaction that the marketer, who's usually the behavioral specialist in the company can say, hmm, I think you're onto something. Let's go test that out. Um, and, and that's really all it takes in a big company is structured, ritualized cross-fertilization ideas. And I can tell you working for big public food and beverage companies, it never happened. They're just in their silos? Oh, it's worse than that. They're in wars. How I so? Worked for, budget, I, budget wars? No, uh, purely ideological disciplinary battles. So um, I worked for a big food company that should go unmentioned. It's one, it, when I started working for them, they were one of the lowest performers, lowest year over year growth rate in the industry. Wall Street was just screaming at them on every call. Um, no internal innovation culture, completely arrogant beyond belief in every department. I've never met people so arrogant in my life. Oh, so unwilling to year, learn, so uncurious. And when I say arrogant, I mean, they would just get in arguments with every consultant and vendor. <laughs> they didn't want you there, even though you were hired to be there. Yeah. But worse, the culture was so toxic that the lower level people were empowered to be jerks to everyone who came in to try to help. Um, that's a warning sign. But the other one was that, R, you know, R and the R and D folks, they were all they. my first conversations were basically making fun of the marketers. How worthless they were. That's crazy. I mean, they actually That's tried crazy. to create their, they tried to create their own marketing division. They hired MBA marketers. They tried to create a separate company inside it to get in a, because they just wanted to create their own ideas and commercialize them without getting the marketers involved. I mean, it was literally a locker room battle. Wow. At the maturity level of a high school. And, and you were in the, in the middle of all this. How no, we were, you... unfortunately, we were allied to the R and D. And so we had to, you know, Okay. It, it only lasted as long as that guy was around. So okay. I think the, the problem was that um, that's not, I, that, that's an extreme case, but it's actually not that isolated. 
you know, I think the bureaucracies for marketing and art are huge at these companies. And, I, and without structured 3M style cross fertilization rituals and stuff like that, you don't take that person seriously. It's like a, it's like any ethnic battle. It's, it, it's like what's going on in Israel right now. So if you don't hang out with people across that boundary, you can never have empathy with them. You can only have the most superficial intellectual empathy. That doesn't, that doesn't create, that doesn't create in the environment for innovation to happen, right? But my point about this was really that R&D, R&D might come up with something that they say they can do, but not clearly know how to bring it to market. But the marketer, if they're just brought in early into that discovery process, because they were having golf with the guy, right? Right. So they're gonna find out about it. Yeah. And there's a there's a ritual of a safe space to share that, right? So the R and D kind of the R and D can actually admit in front of the MBA, right? And there's a degree thing going on too. There's a PhD in food science versus an MBA, and that's a sh that's that alone can create a battle. Yeah. Who's smarter? <laughs> so it's just like, so if you can create that safe space. You know, maybe they can just sit down and put two functional specialists together. Um, uh, interesting things can happen very quickly in a big company. What I used to see in big companies that killed innovation and entrepreneurial thinking was, was an old tendency, I think, in conservative American bureaucracies, which is, I think it comes out of a certain management style. I don't know who started it, but they're probably dead. Um, <laughs> And that is, oh, I know how we get the best idea. Laura, you know how we get the best idea? We put 10 marketers in the room and they fight it out. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding you. And they would do the same thing with consumer insights. I mean, I know companies that hired two different teams to research the same thing just so the VP, the general manager could see what they came up with. He, can, he pit his own, his own direct people against each other. They hired their own vendors. This is just... Yeah. You know, and it's this bureaucratic obsession with the perfect answer, right? I work with entrepreneurs all day long. They do not care about perfection. The ones that are actually doing well. Yeah, <laughs> they don't just let, don't. Don't, don't let perfect hold you back, right? No, these guys are, I mean, you've heard the phrase bias to action. And I used to laugh at that. But I mean, the reality is it's true. I mean, when you hang out with actual entrepreneurs, they just do that 90% of the time they're doing something. 90% of the time they're making a decision. 10% of the time they're thinking about it. In a bureaucracy, it's the absolute inverse. And one way you feed that is by this ridiculous habit of um, internal review, um, secondary feedback, tertiary feedback, quaternary feedback, you know, let's have five marketers weigh in. Come on. You know, <laughs> like the best way to avoid any responsibility in bureaucracy is unfortunately to get a lot of input because then you can't assign blame. This is how people manage their careers, right? So if you really want to be innovative like 3M, you have to have a culture in which they're, they're, you can't have a blame game because the consensus is, is how everybody operates all the time. Not the consensus, but the collaboration. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think I haven't worked in 3M, but my sense is from what I read about their internal culture, they would never assign like five marketers to weigh in and four R&D, no. I mean, you, th you see how hard it is to have a meeting on innovation with one marketing MBA, one sales guy, one PhD in food science. Those meetings almost never happen in a food company. That's amazing. I mean, that's It's pathetic. So it's obvious. absolutely pathetic. It's, so in smaller companies, I mean, we certainly have <laughs> hopefully less bureaucratic layers and yeah. should be easier to manage. Uh, privately held, you know, owner... Uh, founder led, especially, you know, yes, um, yes, they're looking for change. And so it really does start at the top to, to make Absolutely. sure you do have an innovation culture. So I want to switch gears a little bit, James. Yeah, I want to sure. talk about differentiation. You know, we started out by talking about <laughs> consumer poll. Yeah, and, yeah. and now I want to talk about differentiation because I, I work with clients on how to help them be more valuable, how to clarify their you know, their value prop and, and ultimately how are they different than mm -hmm. everyone else who does what they do. Mm -hmm. And some people say, oh, it's my, it's my customer service. Okay. But is that really, you know, differentiating? Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about what was in your book. You talked about what's a commodity, you know, and being memorable versus forgettable. Yeah. So let, let's hit on that for a minute. Cause I know there's a few brands that you, 
you know, you gave as examples here. So in our audience, if there's people thinking about, oh, how can I really make my company stand out? What, how can I differentiate? How should we think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think there, you know, the first thing I'd say, which I said in my book, is what you're looking for is a mix of what I would call the four Ps of, of uh, strategic planning, the product price placement and, and promotional activity. Um, but you could add on some more related to more exotic things like experience, customer experience. Uh, you need to find a couple of those pillars where you already have a strength that your fans have identified. Not you, not the management team on the golf course, but your fans. <laughs> And if you don't know what that is, then that's another reason to go do some open inquiry with your fans, figure out what is what do these people share in common that defines why we're so good in their eyes. Um, and use that information to define what your key strengths are. And then you need to really double down on those strengths. The key, the key is you have to really be willing to do an honest competitive assessment to see which one of those things that you're good at, that your fans like about you, that other companies are unlikely to match you on. And that's where you get to Harvard Business School kind of business strategy. But let's, in, let's in, 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 in but I think it needs to start with an understanding of the behavior. That That's yeah. where I'm different. <laughs> let's talk about that. I, there's there's a, an assumption that you you, the business owner, knows what that answer is, right? Yeah. They've been buying from you for years and they've been your customer for years. Oh. But then you probably get to a point where you don't really know. Oh, no, now, yeah. Is this yeah. the kind of thing where it's the same thing? We want to just call people up and ask about the category? Yep. How do you get to a level of understanding? And, you know, if we were going to draw a two by two. Yeah. And, and plot our company versus others on there. I think how that. How do we approach this? I still think you do the open inquiry. And I think with, with private companies that have succeeded to the extent of getting into nine figures, right? And say you're 30, 40, 50 years old or a family private family and private company, you're at the most, most at risk for just assuming um, why people are buying your thing. Um, because you haven't, <laughs> you haven't had the kind of uh, headwinds that a big company, big public firm has had in recent decades. And so if you haven't done that open inquiry, you really need to, you need to just put all your assumptions aside. Um, and, uh, and I actually encourage people to write them down. The assumptions. Yeah. Because otherwise, <laughs> this is another thing, even in a, <laughs> this is actually a problem with otherwise incredibly intelligent Sea level folks, as they will reimagine what their assumptions were after the research is done. <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> so that they don't they don't feel so humiliated. Um, but you have to be open to that. Oh my god! Because here's the thing: is when you if you uncover something about the outcomes or or, or something about your product design that you didn't get, you didn't really see, that is now actually your modern competitive advantage, and it was really far removed from what got the company going 30, 40 years ago you're going to, it's going to be terrifying to realize that you've been running this thing. You didn't know why anyone was buying it, but that you have to be, you have to be open to the terror because that's the motivation. All right. So write it down and then do your open inquiry. And I would have someone else do it, not top folks, because <laughs> they're the most attached to the assumptions. Yeah. Right. And they probably feel like they have the most at stake in terms of their own personal. Yeah. Yeah. So have someone else do it. Um, and I would say not a direct report. I'm, I'm not joking when I say have your customer service people like run the interview. I'm not joking at all. Um, because they're, they're or so orthogonal that they just don't care. I mean, they're just going to, they'll write it up, honestly. Then some customer service person is not worried about getting fired by a CEO of a $300 million company. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> I mean, there's so there's so there are like so many layers away from that. <laughs> they can actually be honest. Right. Right. That's the beauty of it. Well, if you go down the chain, <laughs> find someone independent, whether they're in your company yeah. or not. There are, not, there are yeah. certainly services 
uh, and consultants that, that do this. And, and that's another way to get independent. I would say that, yeah. I mean, I think the folks that do something called design research generally tend to be the shops that are, do know how to do open inquiry really, really well and not make assumptions. And they'll do all that context. But yeah, do that contextual inquiry and you may discover that there's something new. There's something modern. There's a modern set of drivers now behind the category. Um, and I, my consulting career began with a renovation of the Triscuit Cracker brand. Woohoo! Um, one of the oldest, of a cracker. <laughs> yeah, one of the one of the oldest brands in the Nabisco portfolio now owned by Mondelez. And we came. We were the fresh set of eyes, and we, you know, we told them based on internal research, you know, which we sort of inferentially applied, and it was very easy for us to do. Which is like, you, we basically shocked the crap out of these executives who were making most of their money selling Ritz and Oreo, by the way. So Triscuit was kind of like this, the thing just, it kept growing at a slow rate. You know, it was like a, a nice cash flow profit creator, but it wasn't, it didn't show the signs of becoming big, right? And so for them, it was kind of a little, that was like the new MBA. You put the new MBA on that one. <laughs> because like no one, apparently no one can screw it up too bad but no one's ever gotten it to grow, so who cares? So that's how they treated it. Same and we shocked, the, yeah, we shocked the crap out of them and said, you, do, you guys, do you realize that the Triscuit is, um, that's your only 100% natural product? Do you know that? And they were like, what? And then they started looking at the ingredient panel like, oh, you're right, it's only got three ingredients. I'm like, do you know it's been that way since 1904? <laughs> So there's your story, right? So there's your marketing story. That's pretty easy. Um, and then here's your new positioning, which is who are you going to sell this to? You're going to sell this. You're going to sell this at Costco to rich moms who buy organic food. And so, you know, within a few years, they had an organic skew out. It's a big seller at Costco by four of them, you know, yeah. organic Triscuit, right? <laughs> so, um, and who's going to get a good price on organic wheat? Um, Nabisco will. So, so, you know, it, it was a very easy, like positioning change for them, but it was based on understanding who their current buyers were. And the fact that those, that buying base was no longer in the 1950s, right. they were in the, they were in the two thousands. Right. And so the new buyer base looked at Triscuit differently. They, att they attributed a different set of attributes and a different why behind the purchase. But this is a brand, when we work with them, this is a brand that didn't done consumer research they hadn't done open consumer research probably in 30 years because they hadn't done an ad campaign, which is when you normally do it. <laughs> so they got you know, way comfortable. Oh, talk about assuming they knew what it was. They had a giant heart symbol on it. Like it was about a, it was about the lower quarter of the package was a giant bulging pulsating heart with the American Heart Association because someone had done research in the eighties saying that whole wheat, you know, was tied to heart health. And that, that was a big thing back then, but we were like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is, this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is so dated. <laughs> That's such a good example of a, stag so, of a stagnation, right? They had the cash cow, they left it alone. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I think that's a really, really good example. So you know, and and there, are many, there are many companies that are, I don't know, they're growing a little faster than inflation, like one or 2%, probably some people listening. Life's not bad. I can hand you some people who are having a bad day because their business is going down 20% a year, but that's not bad. And then you get really comfortable. And that's when you, you either miss out on growth because you didn't ask these questions or what, re what actually could happen is that you do start nose diving and it happens so fast, Lori, suddenly you're going down double digits. And it could be as something as simple as in food and beverage, the formula. But you never wanted, you didn't see it coming because you didn't do any, you didn't do any open inquiry with the consumers who are starting to critique the company and the products. Right? Yeah. So I, I, when I talk to people about running bigger, more established brands, whether they're big, super big or not, I always tell people, don't, don't do the focus group. If you must do a focus, don't do the focus group on why do you like Triscuit? That is like the biggest waste of corporate dollars because people just hand you nonsense. What would be much more interesting with the same focus group is, is to hire, is to recruit people who, who stopped eating it. 
and then find out why. Yeah. Is there any pattern that I should know about? Because that could be your early signal that, uh uh-oh, the trend wizards of the future are about to hit us with a sledgehammer. So what are we going to do? Exactly. And you need five to seven years of runway. You really do, the bigger you are, because you've that's how long it takes to commercialize um, new things that may be technological or involve, involve technological innovation. And most of the great stuff, most of the clients I work with are doing technological innovation. Most people don't understand that because they think it's like tech versus consumer. It's like, are you kidding me? Spin drift. Spin drift is internally manufactured because there's no seltzer plant. They're all controlled by Coke and Pepsi, seltzer water plants. They're all controlled on contract, most of their volume. So, um, you know, you think that they're gonna, you think that they're gonna retool their seltzer line to put fruit juice through it? No. And when they do, this was Bill Creelman talked about this publicly. So I'm not violating any NDAs, but <laughs> when you put fruit juice through a seltzer plant, you have to basically shut the factory down and clean the all the piping out before you do plain seltzer again. So do you think anyone's going to take that business for a tiny startup? No, they're laughing right out the door. So, you know, they actually got, I think, got fired by a co-man because he he was too stupid to ask this question. <laughs> he had to clean his plant out. Oh, no. <laughs> so they got kicked out, right? So, you know, they had to go create a manufacturing ecosystem for what was an unbelievably simple idea, Lori. Like, hey, I know, let's make, let's make fruit-flavored seltzer water with fruit juice and not a labs, not a laboratory chemical, which we label natural flavors. Radical. Which is actually a synthetic product in most cases. So it's just, it's a, it's fake. Right. So, you know, but that's super conceptual thing, which is, I just want a salsa water. That's not a, like a, not a magical mystery wizard of Oz tour. And guess who likes that? Who Guess who wants that? Very educated, rich people. <laughs> so, you know, Spindrift basically knows knew that from their own, probably their own social life, right? And so the question was, let's go figure out how to make it because I have my audience already. They're, they're ready to buy it by the case. Um, but you've got to be willing to do that innovation. That takes time, right? Now, Spindrift is an early stage brand. They know that they're on a seven to 10 year ramp up because that's part of the game. But when you work with companies that are nine and 10 figures, Lori, they just don't, they rarely have that patience. Um, but that's actually what it usually takes uh, when you want to do something that's truly going to be innovative in a manufacturing ecosystem. There's usually something you have to change the equipment based on a simple conceptual innovation. And if you didn't do the open inquiry with consumers five to seven years before, you're not, you know, you didn't, you aren't looking ahead enough as you're driving your car down the road, right? Yeah. So it's as simple as that analogy, right? Don't stare at your hood ornament when you drive because you'll probably crash. (laughs) Well, on on that note, James, as we wind this interview down, we talked about a lot and I want to make sure that people get a sense of what's actionable for them. So how how might you summarize? We've we've talked about differentiation. We've talked about uh, lots of things here. Um, Demand-driven growth, you know, creating consumer pull. I think that your customer, if what, I were, what are some three top three things that you might say, Hey, if you want to make sure that you're continuing to innovate or you're thinking about innovation, where do they start? Uh, it starts at the CEO's desk with his leadership or her leadership team. They need to create essentially a division and it could be five people at your smaller company, right? It'd be five people. Each is a functional wizard, like very experienced and they need to, have part of their time dedicated to looking down the road five to seven years out in consumer behavior in their manufacturing cat in the categories that their manufacturing ecosystem ties to, you know, this, the world I'm in at least, and then do that open inquiry on a regular basis. You don't have to do it more than once a year from that. You should be able to surface unmet needs and problems that your ecosystem could potentially solve. And then it's a matter of figuring out which ones, have the most scalability. And that's where you probably want to bring it 
local folks, either like myself, although I don't do a lot of work with mid-market companies, someone might twist my hand. <laughs> um, you know, you bring someone in who's really skilled at sorting and prioritizing those opportunities, quantifying those opportunities. And then you need to start actually the process of commercializing two or three of them. But you have to do it knowing that you're going to kill some of them sometime down the line, like a venture capitalist decides that they're going to stop giving money to bad ideas. Right? Um, but you have to create that C-level team where the people on the team have no functional overlap. They do the open inquiry with consumers. They create the pipeline of, of ideas. Um, and if you do this five to seven years ahead of where your core consumer bringing in today's profits is, uh, I, I you know, the companies that are doing this well can, you know, they can grow and remain private and they can grow 20, 30% a year because they're continually launching things that are on trend, as I like to say. Um, but really what they're doing is they're actually launching them with niches uh, who are feeding the mainstream of America in their category. And when you can figure out that dynamic, um, you can plan a lot of this ahead like an insurance policy on your business, an insurance policy on growth, at least, assuming oh. you, you do want to grow. And, and I like that. I like so that I, a lot. So I think the, the you know, I, I'm not <laughs> going to attack a, a family-owned company that's pulling in 300 million and is happy growing at 5%. All I can say is if you if you sell anything to consumers and, and you're banking on 5% carrying you to retirement, running your family company, you're crazy. Because I've seen things change really fast for companies like that. And suddenly yeah. they're making nine, negative 5% gross sales. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, you, you've, uh, you've put out a lot of, uh, of really good sayings during this interview. But I want to ask, because I, I love to ask my guests, if they have a favorite mm. saying about entrepreneurship or leadership, what comes to your mind? Of all the people I work with, entrepreneurs or big company executives, the ones who are the most successful at getting change to happen and making use of like external ideas, um, they're leaders who are just fanatically curious. And, you know, if I had to explain why curiosity matters so much as a leadership trait, um, it's because curiosity is related to doubt. And, and it's the doubt that I actually know what the hell I'm talking about. Um, and only an academic could, could put this together because, you know, when you've been through a PhD program and you've been brutalized that badly <laughs> by other people, you, you walk out realizing how little you know about anything by the time you get your PhD. <laughs> <laughs> That's not yeah. a commercial to get your PhD. <laughs> no, no, it's not at all. But I mean, the, the reality is that the only reason you would complete a degree program like that is this you're fanatically curious, right? And so what happens is you you institutionalize that doubt in your brain and good executives do that. They don't become insecure, they don't become fear driven, but they're folks that I've worked with who made use of you know ideas that were handed to them really effectively internally were the ones who are like, they were always the internal, they're always the internal critic, right, of their companies. Sure. You know, and they were curious and you, it helps if that internal critic is the CEO, I hate to say it. Absolutely. No you know? <laughs> so, so last thing, James, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to find you online? Uh, I would go to LinkedIn. Yeah. People are welcome to send me in mail. That's often how I begin conversations with folks on LinkedIn. Uh, just look up. Dr. James Richardson, I should pop up pretty quickly. Um, my website's www.premiumgrowthsolutions.com. Uh, that is geared towards my early stage venture backed client base. So may not excite you as much, but there's some free material there that might interest you. Awesome, uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, James, thank you so much for coming on Succession Stories and you've given us a lot to think about. So thanks, I, it's great to talk to you. Thank you, Lori, been a pleasure.